Welcome to the Jerusalem Lights podcast with Rabbi Chaim Richman, whose goal is Torah for everyone. I'm your co-host, Jim Long. And now, Rabbi Chaim Richman. Shalom Aleichem, Jim Long. How are you? Shalom, Rabbi. Doing well. Doing well. It's good to see you, uh, sir. And good to see you you any any day of the week, especially now. And you, sir. Thank you. And here we are in this this, um, post-Tisha B'Av week. Yeah, we're in. We are. We are actually uh, uh, kind of experiencing an amazing uh, shift. Uh, can I even call it a paradigm shift? We're we're experiencing an amazing transition, which I think is such a powerful motif for each one of us, for our lives, for what our unfolding, ever changing, ever evolving ever revelatory relationship with Hashem is really all about. Because just this week on Tisha B'Av, it was basically the lowest points that we could really get to. I mean, when we are, when we are sunken in the reality of the destruction of the temple, another Tisha B'Av has gone by. We still have not rebuilt the temple. I do want to report to you about uh, the experience of being on the Temple Mount on Tisha B'Av with, with so many Jews that came up to the Temple Mount in purity and, and the whole ensuing controversy over recent Temple Mount developments. I, w- I want to talk to you about that. But anyway, so there we are, right? It's Tisha B'Av. It's the day of the destruction. We seem to be stuck. And of course, you know, my, my feeling about this is that we are ultimately responsible <laughs> for the fact that the temple is not being rebuilt because we certainly could see to it that it is rebuilt if we wanted to. And it's not something that we're supposed to be waiting on God for. We're supposed to be making it happen. But anyway, so there, there that is, right? You know, the, this is, I'm fond of saying, uh, I, I can't find anywhere in the Torah in reference to the temple uh, where I can never find a phrase where God says, wait, wait till you wait. Don't build it just yet. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, in, Hashem in fact, is the one. The, that, yeah. He's the one that's waiting. This, this is, this echoes the, 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 you know, the incredible verses in the beginning of the prophet Haggai and the whole, the whole prophecy there of Haggai, his whole, his whole mission was to try and um, stir up those who had returned from the Babylonian exile, who were, who were being very, lethargic about the rebuilding after they had received Cyrus's permission. And he was complaining to them and they were saying to him things which we actually are still hearing today, the same excuses. He was, he, he was saying to them, you know, it's time to build. And they were saying, and they were saying to him, no, it's not time yet. It's not Mm -hmm. time yet. And then he said, is it time for you to sit in your comfortable houses and this house is in, is in ruins. And that's just, that's just it. They thought that it wasn't time. But, you know, here again, in, in uh, what's, what's become known as Jewish theology, even though it's basically a, a scam that people are, are, are um, uh, um, perpetuating their, their own, you know, self-defense mechanisms, it's, it's not Jewish theology, but they're saying things like, that, you know, it's going to come down from heaven and Mashiach is going to build it and it's not our problem and all this kind of, of stuff. But anyway... Back to basics. Here we are. Today is the twelfth day of the month of Menachem Av, and this Shabbat is the fifteenth. And this Shabbat is called Tu Be'av. You've heard of yeah. Tu B'Shat, right? Yeah, this- the fifteenth of Shabbat. And Tu Be'av is actually a um, a lesser known festival, which in the time of the Holy Temple was such an important day that the Mishnah. At the end of tractate, tractate Ta'anit actually tells us that in the day that the Holy Temple stood, the two happiest days of the year for the nation of Israel were Yom Kippur and Tuba'av. No. And then no. the sages begin to discuss the subject and they say, and again, that in itself is, is, is a surprise probably to a lot of people who think that Yom Kippur is very somber or very, or very, very morbid and nothing could be further than the truth because Yom Kippur is this wonderful day of spiritual realignment and, and Hashem's promise that of forgiveness. So the sages say, well, why, why is Yom Kippur so happy? Because of Hashem's forgiveness. Why was Tubav so happy? The fi- to the 15th, Tetvav, the 15th of the month of Av. And so they begin begin to discuss the various things that happen throughout history on that day that make it so remarkable. 
It's very, very amazing. Uh, wh one of the things, um, the earliest, actually, the earliest uh, historical event that took place on that day was that it was the day that the, uh, officially, that the last of the, of the generation of the deserts stopped dying as the decree was over. Yeah. And then because of the, and the, the celebratory nature in the eyes of the sages in those days was that because of the fact that during all of those years of the decree against that generation, as we've discussed, there was a certain kind of divine wrath in the world. But once the decree was over, the spirit of prophecy returned. Yeah. And that was the first day, the 15th of Av, that Moshe received the word of Hashem again. But anyway, Jim, I just want to share with you at this in this juncture in time and space because it's so totally compelling and amazing to hear. I want I want to share with you this little known teaching about what what this was really all about. Was that and I think you're aware of this, but that when Hashem made the decree against the generation of the desert that they were all going to die in the desert, the members of that generation only died on the ninth of Av every year. Yeah. A certain number of them, a certain number of thousands of them would die on the ninth of Av, not on some day like Valentine's Day or, or, or uh, uh, Thanksgiving. They would always die on that particular day. And the yeah. way that it worked, according to the Talmud, which is very chilling. They dug their own is, graves. Exactly. Every, Everybody every, in the camp would dig yeah. their own grave right. and lie in it that night. And then in the morning... Moshe Rabbeinu would pass through the camp and, and saying out, let the, let the living separate from the dead. And whoever woke up, got up out of their grave. And so the iconography of that whole scene is just so incredibly moving, you know, like that, because a lot of people made it another year, but some thousands didn't. And everyone basically took care of all of their paperwork, I like to say, the night before in terms of their saying goodbye to their family and everything. They knew their time was limited. But in the last year, so on the, on the morning of the 9th of Av, everybody woke up. Yeah. And so the people were concerned that perhaps they made a, a um, mistake in the calculation. Yeah. And so what they did was they continued to sleep in their graves for another few days until the 15th of Av, and on that day, because the moon was full on the 15th, they knew that they couldn't possibly have made a mistake. And that became one of the reasons for this celebration. The interesting thing about that accounting that our sages are telling us is basically that they're, that they're, give, they're giving us a little bit of a, um, of a wink to a certain kind of um, neurosis, because instead of just being happy that first, the first morning of Tisha B'Av that they were all alive, they thought, well, maybe we should still sleep in our graves for a few more days. Maybe we made a mistake. It's like, you know, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe it's our fault. Should, 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 is this good? Should we, should I go back to my grave? Mm -hmm. And so the beautiful feeling about, about that morning of, of Tubav was basically like, no, you don't have to sleep in a grave anymore. It's no. over. Don't, don't hold on to the past. Anyway, so it was this statement of divine love it was a statement of divine love and, and the spirit of prophecy came back. And there, there are numerous other reasons that are given and uh, several of them have to do with marriage because it's, uh, it's also a day later in history when the, the tribes of Israel were permitted to marry with each other because during the first years as they came in until, the, until all the land was uh, divided and it proportioned to the tribes, they were supposed to marry only within their tribes. But from at this certain point, they were allowed to, to marry with each other. And that was also the, the day later in history that the tribe of Benjamin was reinstated after the, after the whole thing in the book of Judges that we read about that they were kind of um, excommunicated for a while. And then the, there were several other reasons that were given as well. One of them being that from that day on, the uh, position of the sun changes and the days become start becoming a little bit shorter. And it's until that day, only until that day that wood could be brought as an, as an offering for the altar, the wood that was, was to burn on the altar. All sorts of things that are going on in that in that whole discussion. It's amazing. But what I what I want to say about it is that on a deep level, on a mystical level, there is a tradition that I must share with you that associates that day with the building of the third temple. In fact, there is evidence if you do some Talmudical archaeology 
there is evidence that in the days of the temple, there was a week long festival from the, 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 the ninth of Av, crescendoing with the 15th of Av when the temple stood, celebrating this entire week in, in the days of the temple's um, strength, a heyday. And there is this whole beautiful idea that, that's, that that day is associated with the building of the temple. In fact, one of the verses that the sages discuss in that discussion is the verse from the Song of Songs, um, go out and see daughters of Jerusalem, um, King Solomon on the day, the day um, and the crown, the crown that his mother crowned him on the, the day of um, his wedding and the day of the joy of his heart. And the day, the day of his wedding is an allusion to the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. And the day of the joy of his heart is the day of the building of the temple. And to make a very, very, very long story, very, very short, I just want to say one more thing. This whole uh, concept of this um, sh shift from mourning, which was what we were involved with basically on Sunday, the, the crescendo of the three weeks of mourning is the ninth of Av. This whole shift from mourning to joy, from the destruction to the potential for the rebuilding is reflected exactly in so many words in Psalms 30. And Psalms 30, which in itself is, is one of my favorite Psalms, and I've taught about it so many times. It's the song which was used as the, as the song that was sung for the inauguration of the first and second temples. And it's also going to be sung at the inauguration of the third temple, right? And in that chapter, which, which by the way, other than the first introductory verse, a song for the inauguration of the temple of David, it doesn't even discuss anything about the temple, but rather Psalm 30 discusses all sorts of extremes of human emotions, of fears, of a feeling of vulnerability, of, of a feeling of joy and a feeling of sadness, because that is the whole essence of the experience of the temple, of being a real person, of having ups and downs, of admitting our vulnerability, of, of striving for a relationship with Hashem. That's what the temple comes to amplify and magnify. But anyway, in the end of that chapter, we read these beautiful verses. It says, it says, Hear Hashem and favor me. Hashem, be my helper. You have transformed my lament into dancing for me. You undid my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. And th that verse, you have transformed my lament into dancing. You undid my sackcloth and girded me with gladness is the exact description of this week. It's, yeah. so, it's so incredibly moving. That is a description of what we are going through this week as we move from the energy of the ninth of Av to the energy of the 15th of Av, which actually falls out this Shabbat in the, in the Torah reading of Ve'et Hanan, which is one of the most remarkable Torah portions. The whole imagery that you've just translated to us about, the, you know, the idea of going into the graves and, and, and then coming out and being alive. To me, there's a very obvious connection to the resurrection of the dead. What's also important is not to leave out the idea that this is a almost like a, a coming attractions of the resurrection. But you mentioned, of course, the connection to the temple. I think it underscores the idea that we need that temple experience not, not that generations don't have access to, to the world to come. The, the role of Israel really comes alive, if you will. It's resurrected. The, the goal of Israel, the mission of the people of Israel, is resurrected with the building of the temple. It's a kind of a resurrection to rebuild the temple anyway. It's so amazing that you're mentioning all this because I already teased, I think last week, uh, a new film that um, the archaeologist Hillel Richman has ah, been yes. working on about, about the secret of the, the biblical city of Beit El. Mm -hmm. And one of the, one of the uh, things that he discusses there is the secret of the word Luz. Yeah which used to be the name of the place beforehand. And Luz, as you know, has to do with the secret of the resurrection, the Luz bone. 
And the Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chanan Mitzato, describes the, the Western Wall as the loose bone of the Holy Temple. Right. So yes, there is a certain secret that the, that the Holy Temple itself is part of the process of, of resurrection, as it were. And I also want to say on a simple level, because we're, we're getting kind of into the outer outer limits here. But on a, <laughs> and, and no, because I'm always very concerned about making Torah as practical and yes. applicable as possible for everyone right now, because that because it's messages for this world right now, right Amen. here right now. Amen. And, the, and the fact is that this this process that we're describing of what's going on this week is a message for the whole world that Israel is broadcasting in terms of overcoming despair, in terms of what we've been talking about for so many weeks now, the concept of the consoling father, Menachem Av, that everything is an aspect of Hashem's love and concern, whether or not it's revealed, whether or not it's, it's, it's um, recognizable. And however it is manifest, it's still ultimately for the ultimate good. But this week we see this, this uh, process, this, this, this paradigm shift of movement from destruction to rebuilding from the 9th of Av to the 15th of Av. The 15th of Av, again, it's so unsung now. And actually in modern Israel, uh, traditionally, it's been portrayed as a sort of Jewish Valentine's Day, as a yeah. certain a day of a, of a festival of love. And the reason for that, as I mentioned, is because several of the ancient um, events that took place on this day that the sages of the Talmud talk about have to do with love and marriage have to do with the concept of the reinstatement of, of, of Benjamin and, the, and the, um, the tribes marrying with each other. And, uh, on, but on a deeper level, it has to do with the, the, the level of the love between Hashem and Israel and for all people. And, and, it, and it's a strong motif in not giving up hope and in understanding our, you know, Hashem's basically waiting on us for the joy of his heart, which is the rebuilding of the temple. And the thing is also that that this day, again, in the days of the temple, it's considered to be the happiest day of the year together with Yom Kippur. And today, you know, I, I kind of have a personal mission of educating people about the power of the day because it's, and what, we're, what we've talked about here the past few minutes is barely scraping the surface of the incredible spiritual strength and potential of this day, which is this Shabbat, right? The 15th of Av. And besides all that, it's also on a, on a mystical level, the, the the month of of Menachem Av is is changing drastically in its very essence from that day. The middle of it, it the middle of that month begin the month begins to straighten out, as it were, in terms of the light that we are receiving, and in terms of this period of time now, ushering in becoming the 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 um, hallway leading us into Elul. Which of course is the last month of year, the year, and the time of Ani Dodili, the time of closeness to Hashem, the time when the king is in the field, the time of preparing for the awesome high holy days of Tishrei. So, this last part of the month of Menachem Av now becomes this time of preparation. And in fact, this Shabbat, we need to talk about the Torah reading of Ve'et Hanan, which is of course beginning in chapter three of Deuteronomy and verse twenty-three, right in the middle. But the Haftorah, the prophetic reading for this coming Shabbat is none other than uh, in the book of um, Isaiah, the chapter of uh, consolation um, uh, beginning in Isaiah 40, Nachamo, Nachamo Ami, be consoled, be consoled my people. This Shabbat, just like last Shabbat was called the Shabbat of vision, because of the vision of Isaiah, this Shabbat is called the Sabbath, the Sabbath of consolation. And it begins a period now known as the seven weeks of consolation until Rosh Hashanah. But this whole idea that I was trying to emphasize from Psalm 30 is, is um, a microcosm of what we like to refer to as the indefatigable spirit of what the people of Israel are all about and what, and what Hashem is telling us, what he's broadcasting us to us all the time. Here, Moshe Rabbeinu pleads to enter the promised land and as you point out so often, he displays his utter selflessness by turning around and petitioning the people and reminding them that their mission is, is so unique that it can only be fulfilled fully right there in the land, keeping the Torah commandments every day, not, you know, not, as, not as a religion, but as, as a national 
way of life. A Ident- national identity. There exactly. was no option. In Moshe's words and in, and in Hashem's words, there was no option of New Jersey. Yeah. Right. Or 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 uh, Manchester, England, or anything. Yeah. There's no option. It's not like it's not like this is a good idea. Or I hope you'll do it this way. There was no other option. In fact, every time uh, a, a, the other option is alluded to in the Torah, it's in the context of a punishment that you will be exiled. In this chap, in this very very chapter in Ve'etchanan, we have here a warning of exile. Um, Right here, uh, when you beget children and grandchildren and will have been long in the land, you will grow corrupt and make a carved image, a likeness of anything, and you will do evil in the ways, in the eyes of Hashem, your God, and to anger him. I appoint heaven and earth this day to bear witness against you that you will surely perish quickly from the land to which you are crossing the Jordan to possess it. Hashem will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where Hashem will lead you. There you will serve gods, the handiwork of men of wood and stone, which do not see and do not hear and do not eat and do not smell. And then in verse 29 here in chapter four, he assures us from there, you will seek Hashem, your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. And then he will, he will bring you back. And then he will bring you back. Yeah. So the, the, this Torah portion is... I, I think you could really refer to it as the heart, certainly of the book of Deuteronomy and maybe of the whole Torah. Yeah. There's so much in it. It's it's such an incredible microcosm. But as you mentioned, it Ve'et Hanan literally means and I implored, and, and I beseeched, and I I begged. The, the root of it, the root of that word uh, Hanan, uh, if you want to break it down even more, meaning grace or favor. But uh, this type of prayer that's described here is when a person is asking for something not based on their own merit or anything other than just from Hashem's, um, it's called his, his treasure house of, of undeserved favor. And so Moshe is recounting and he's saying, at that time, I begged Hashem, let me now cross and see the good land that is on the other side of the Jordan, this good mountain and the Lebanon. And this in itself is an unbelievable uh, thing because this is an allusion to the Holy Temple. Yeah. Moshe did not want to see Lebanon. This is a, an allusion. The, the good mountain is an allusion to Jerusalem and the Lebanon, as we find this as well in, in Song of Songs, is an allusion to the concept of the Beit HaMikdash because the root of that word is Lavan, which means whiten, white. Yeah. And the concept that he's alluding to is that the Holy Temple whitens the sins of a person. Right. Because it brings about the process whereby a person can, can reunite with Hashem through repentance. So, so there's this whole thing going on here, this whole backstory that as Moshe is reviewing, he's talking about at that point when Hashem told him that he can't go in, he employed him. He implored him to be able to go in. And th- there's this idea also in the mystical teachings of Torah, that Moshe prayed 515 prayers. 515 specific, individual, singular, homemade prayers for 515 different reasons why he wanted to come into the land. And that is the numerical value of this word. Yeah. And that if he would have prayed one more prayer, Hashem would have acquiesced. And that's why Hashem became, it says Hashem said, it is, it is too much for you. Do not continue to speak to me further about this matter because it was not, it was not tenable for him to come in for many reasons that you and I have discussed that it was not in the, in the best interest of the people of Israel for him to come in. He was not in sync with that generation, but Joshua was and Pinchas was, and it wasn't for him. And that was part of this setup where, of why he even struck the rock in the first place. Hashem did not want him to go in. He'll go in later with that generation, as you said, at the time of the resurrection. So he's praying 515 times and he knows that secret. And so does Hashem and he stops there. But what's going on here that I want to emphasize is the unbelievable poignancy I didn't pronounce the G this time because you told me not to. The <laughs> unbelievable poignancy of, of this, it's just the pathos is so palpable because he is just this one thing that he wants in the world is to be able to go in. 
the one thing that he wants. And Hashem says, I'm going to let you see it, right? And the Midrash talks about how he didn't want to go in to go to the to go to uh, Israel's uh, natural uh, attractions or to or to or, or, or he wanted to go in for the commandments of that you were able to fulfill there for Hashem's will. He wanted to be able to go in, and the incredible irony of all of this is again, it's just it's so palpable that it, you can just cry just thinking about it. That it's so easy to come to Israel today. I mean, I, I could have said that two years ago. Now I, I feel like I'm saying that to you because I know how badly you want to come as well as so many people and it's become more difficult yeah. right now uh, during the, the whole COVID thing and ever-changing rules, but people are beginning to come. But the point is um, a lot of people show disdain. A lot of Jews show disdain for the land of Israel, which is very disturbing. We're going to be speaking about that, not understanding at all what it, what it is. And all he wanted to be able to do was to be able to to come, which is today so easy, even now, even with COVID, his, uh, uh, um, relative to what Moshe's situation was in, he it was pretty easy for him. So he's he's asking to be able to come in, and that's not going to happen. So then he goes on with his with his um, with his talk, and he, and uh, yes, as you said, now, oh Israel, listen to the decrees and to the ordinances that I teach you to perform, so that you may live, and you will come and possess the land that Hashem, the God of your fathers, gives you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You, the Torah says to possess the land? Yes. What a yes, thought. Absolutely. Here again, verse 5, see, I have taught you decrees and ordinances as Hashem, my God, has commanded me to do so in the midst of the land. Mm -hmm. You know how many times the Torah tells us that the purpose of all of this is so that when you will come into the land, you'll be able to fulfill them. So, so, so he talks about the fact that Jewish identity is all about listening to Hashem. And yeah. doing his commandments in the land. And, and then he goes and he kind of defines um, Jewish um, intelligence, if I, if I may. He defines it by, by saying this. It's right here in chapter 4 in verse 6. Surely a wise and discerning people is this great nation, for which is a great nation that has a God who is close to it, to it, as is Hashem, our God, whenever we call to him, and which is a great nation that has righteous decrees and ordinances such as this entire Torah that I place before you this day. And then he goes on, only beware for yourself and greatly beware for your soul, lest you forget the things that your eyes have beheld, unless you remove from your heart all the days of your life and make them known to your children, your children's children, and everything. Jim, so many times throughout the whole book of Deuteronomy, Moshe returns to the theme of the warning against self-aggrandizement, against forgetting what you saw at Sinai, against forgetting Hashem, against the lure of prosperity, in this Parsha as well, and against yeah. falling into various types of idolatry. But the, but the thing is here, he talks about the good land. He talks about the, he, he talks about the incredible experience of what it was like at Sinai. The, the verses are just so unbelievable how, how, how Hashem spoke to you from the midst of the fire and you were hearing the sound of words, but you were not seeing any, any likeness. All of these verses are so powerful and he's giving over to his children what they should be giving over to their children. And these verses are so amazing. Again, that this is supposedly in the DNA of, of the people of Israel. And, and again, we mentioned those verses where, where he's assuring them that even in exile, if they seek out Hashem, he will, he will return them, right? And look at this, for inquire now regarding the early days that preceded you from the day when God created man on the earth and from one end of heaven to the other end of heaven, has there ever been anything like this great thing or has anything like it been heard? Has a people ever heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire as you have heard and survived? So we have all of these amazing uh, verses and this is kind of like the... the um, the description of what is of the glue that's holding mm -hmm. us together. It, it's, it, it's this collective experience, which is translated into a, a deep level of knowledge. 
And there's this other major component that is stated here in in this Parsha, which you and I talked about. The the Parsha is almost like a mini Torah. It's a Torah within a Torah. All of the major concepts of of Judaism and being a Jew are embedded in this Parsha. And one of them, an important one, is the unity of Hashem, the unity of God. Because hey, the Shema is even in this this parsha, unbelievable. That's why I say this this parsha, Vayet Chanan, is literally a mini Torah or the yeah. heart of the Torah. We have we have the Shema, we mm-hmm. have uh, the the repetition with minor changes of the Ten Commandments in this parsha. Everything about it is like this um, uh, succinct s- s- mission statement yeah. of the people of Israel. And it comes out again on this week of the 15th of Av. It's all wrapped up, bound mm-hmm. up uniquely in this, in this high unity of Hashem. Wouldn't you say that this, this is a recipe, this is the formula for bringing about a time on the planet when the unity of God is recognized, when his name is one, if, if, if God's people would just follow the decrees of living in the land, performing the the Torah daily, being a people so remarkable that the the verse that you just quoted, the the nations will turn and go look at these people, look at the remarkable. Uh, and uh, there feet. is a reciprocity. There is right. there is a reciprocal relationship, uh, like facets of a diamond. Because when Israel is plugged in in their land, mm-hmm. doing doing their thing, that creates this state of excellence and knowledge of Hashem for the whole world. The world should be invested in empowering Israel to fulfill their message. Anyone who is against that, who's against Israel settling the land, uh, who, who, who uh, fights against observing Torah to, to the fullest, which you cannot do unless you are living in Eretz Israel, because he's just said, living in the land, performing these mitzvot, these commandments, teaching your children the Torah, if you're not doing that, the, the unity of Hashem cannot be recognized. And this, everything that we're reading here is so much more than a deed of sale, mm-hmm. which we've already had. What we're having here is we're having Hashem's assurance. This is where you belong. This is what mm-hmm. you're supposed to be doing. This is, this is it. And like I said, there is no other option. This is where you're supposed to be. And Jim, I, I find it remarkable this past summer, past few weeks, you know, you and I haven't even gotten a chance to discuss it so much, but there have been one after another, there have been dazzling and startling archaeological discoveries here in Israel. Oh, yeah. That's that 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 come from the time of the temple we have we have unearthed a wall from the time of of the first temple we have unearthed coins from the time of the of the rebellion time of the second temple and um and a seal uh with the name of of the biblical ju- judge Gidon on it and all of these unbelievable archaeological discoveries have been made and and and, and this incredible uh large cavernous room um, near the Temple Mount, and all of these unbelievable things. Uh, week after week, the news has been reporting here in Israel about these incredible discoveries, which demonstrate so clearly that we have always been here. Yeah. That we have always been here. It says it, in it, Psalms, it says, the truth shall spring forth from the earth. From the land, from the yeah. earth, from the ground, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and and th- that's, again, what is so remarkable when you have all of these doubters and all of these scoffers and all of these um, uh, elements that are trying to cast all of these doubts on uh, uh, our connection to the land altogether. So So speaking of that, and that is very heavy on my heart this week, and I, I want to talk about it. I want to talk about a number of a number of stories that I think are incredibly important to our listeners, certainly to to me and to you. Um, and and I want to I want to kind of put it in the context of of what most people think is the big story this week. Most people think the big story this week. To paraphrase a byline from Time Magazine, it's the billionaire race in space. <laughs> okay, so you have all these billionaires, the richest people in the world. Richard Branson on July 11th uh, uh, went up 50 miles into suborbital alt- altitude. And of course, uh, yesterday, uh, Jeff Bezos uh, went up 62 miles. And that's it. Billionaires in space. They're all 
trying to, I don't know what the message is there, trying to, trying to save the world or trying to abandon this one now that they have messed it up so much, or, now, or maybe now that they own it, now that they own this world and all of us, I guess they are looking for some other alternative. Maybe they're, they're looking for God or maybe they think they are God, whatever it is. Uh, their obsession right now, I guess when you get enough money, uh, you want to go into space. Well, so, okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it scarily uh, evokes the the prophecies about about Esau and Edom that you shall you shall scale the heights of heaven. I mean, this is what they've literally done. The, these men, you know, one who, by the way, looks suspiciously like Lex Luthor from my childhood comic book. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I know who you mean. So anyway, acts like him too. But anyway, so listen. Yeah. So so um, bringing the Torah back down to earth again, because as far as I am concerned, uh, no matter what anybody ever will say, this is the world that Hashem created for us. And this is the world that he loves. And this is the world where we belong. And this is the world where we have a future. But we, of course, again, and this is always the message. It's about our responsibility towards this world. So listen, uh, the first thing I want to talk to you about is I want to report to you from the Temple Mount and the experience that we had on the 9th of Av. To me, of course, that is the most um, apropos and important um, experience to have on that day, to go to the place of the Holy Temple on the 9th of Av. Of course, I'm referring to ascend ascending the Temple Mount and according to Torah law, which um, which uh, involves uh, uh, preparation and uh, attention to requirements for how how the state that one must be in, in terms of uh, preparation to ascend there. And so, we went to the Temple Mount, and I think there were approximately seventeen hundred Jews that ascended that day, which was a very a very beautiful experience. And uh, like shortly before. Um, to Shabbat there was a um, a special uh, presentation on an Israeli television news channel, an investigative report that was uh, that was um, focusing on the apparent change in what's been known as the status quo on the Temple Mount recently, a recent recently a certain erosion of the status uh, quo in that. Quietly, kind of under the radar, the Israel police have been more or less allowing Jewish prayer. I mean, for years and years and years, people that have listened to me know that the Israel police um, would make it extremely difficult for Jews to express themselves with any sort of religious sentiment on the Temple Mount in terms of praying, in terms of gesticulating, in terms of showing any sort of uh, religious identification on the Temple Mount. Uh, this in itself is illegal, according to the High Court of Justice, but it's referred to in this ambiguous tone as the, the status quo, which Netanyahu reiterated um, in his last year in office, that uh, second to last year in office, that the status quo is that Muslims can pray on the Temple Mount and non-Muslims can visit the Temple Mount only, right? Which is not legal. But this is, again, our, part of the whole irony of our relationship with Jordan and of our attitude about the Temple Mount in terms of the state. And all that recently has been changing in the in the past, um, I would say, two years slowly. So that recently, um, Jewish people have been able to pray surreptitiously, albeit, and without any sort of outward um, um, garb or any sort of or any sort of religious uh, um, um, things that we would need, books or anything like that. But the police have been quietly allowing Jews to quietly in a very non-provocative manner to be able to pray. And, um, and that's a, a wonderful, wonderful development. And it gives us a feeling that there's some progress here towards Jewish sovereignty, towards the right of the Jewish people to pray as a prerequisite to being, being able to rebuild the temple. So we had the experience on, on the 9th of Av, of course, which is very, very, um, bittersweet and, and very and difficult, but on, on the one hand, on the other hand, very um, nurturing and very empowering and, and very um, spiritually fulfilling to be able to go there on that day. And so the Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, made a statement uh, about how he was happy that the day went by smoothly. And by the way, there were altercations and, and Muslims the night before had stockpiled rocks and all sorts of projectiles inside the mosque. They even cut a hole in the, in the, in the wall of the mosque so that they could throw rocks at us. 
And if you've seen footage from that morning, there were piles of rocks everywhere and there were, there were attempts to disrupt the, the Jewish visits. But so Bennett came in afterwards and said that he was happy that the Jewish people um, were able to exercise freedom of worship because there's freedom of worship for, for everybody on the Temple Mount. That created an incredible storm, an incredible controversy, how he could say such a thing, because that's not the status quo. They we're not supposed to have freedom of worship there. And so he backpedaled immediately for Mr. Lapid took care of that. And he spoke to the King of Jordan and they said, no, 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 that's not what he meant. He just meant that we would be able to visit, but not be able to pray. By the mm -hmm. way, as we speak right now, the Temple Mount is closed to Jews for a few days because of a, of a Muslim festival right now. It's closed to Jews altogether right now. In any event, so this created this whole unbelievable uproar about the fact that he apparently, um, by mistake, he, he, um, he showed some sort of approval and he didn't mean that. And it created, it created a tremendous uh, tension. And uh, so Lapid spoke to the Jordanian monarch and explained that's not what he meant. Don't worry, no change is taking place. Bennett, Bennett didn't mean that. And so, and so this is all just part of this, again, this ridiculous conundrum of, of Israel not officially taking uh, the lead and exercising sovereignty on the Temple Mount because there's always this tremendous concern that it's a powder keg, that it's incendiary, that it could cause unrest. And so uh, he had to kind of uh, backpedal that he, that, he made a, that he made a mistake as, as if he actually was hailing the, 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 um, the, the Jewish worship at the site. And so, and so you know, they were quick to, to backpedal that and say, no, that's not what he meant. So that, that's what I'm dealing with on one level. Again, this, this, uh, oh, this perennial kind of, um, um, you know, weakness and, and, uh, and this um, fear of, of growing up and taking responsibility and saying, yes, the Temple Mount is ours. Yes, it is the holiest place in the world for the Jewish people. And the Jewish people certainly should have the right to pray there instead of this incredible posturing Oh, no, 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 don't worry. We won't pray. We won't move our lips. We won't. We'll just visit. Thank you for allowing us to visit. It's, it's just ridiculous. And it, and it, can, and it broadcasts the, exactly the wrong message to everyone, to, to those that seek the destruction of Israel and to the whole world. If, because if we can be so cavalier about that, which is supposed to be the holiest thing in the world to us, then what right do we have altogether? It's just absurd. They like to boast that Israel is, is this... Uh, it's a bastion of human rights and all this yes. kind, of, uh, kind of stuff. That's all wonderful, except when except it comes to Jews. The Jews, yeah. We don't. We don't have. It's as if it's as if the state of Israel is in itself kind of upholding this anti-Semitic stand that Jews don't have rights after yeah. all. Everybody else but the Jews. So you know, we'll just stay in the back and won't get in anyone's way. We won't. We won't pray. Yeah. Which is so ridiculous because of you, what you and I were discussing a few minutes ago is that Moshe Rabbeinu is making it so clear in this Parsha that, that Jewish identity is about listening to Hashem and about the, the, that's what it means to be a wise and discerning people. These righteous decrees from a God who is close to us whenever we call him and everything he's describing here about our relationship with the good land and his, our experience at Sinai, it's all about the fact you heard his voice. You heard his voice. You shall love Hashem, your God, with all your heart, right? Anyway, so then, so then there's this, uh, I have so much to say here, Jim, today, really, <laughs> I'm losing it. So, so there's a blog in the Times of Israel by a rabbi who's written over 450 articles on Jewish values in over a dozen Christian and Jewish and Muslim magazines and websites. And he, the day, and, the, and, the, and the title of the blog is A Peaceful Way to Restore to the, Jer the Jerusalem Temple. Okay. I wish I could talk about this without just losing it. And so this rabbi is writing that what the bottom line is, in cooperation with Muslims, a hologram of a Jewish house of worship could be projected worldwide from a small space adjacent to the Dome of the Rock. So wow. basically he's saying we can, we can solve this whole problem by rebuilding the temple virtually. We're all virtual anyway. We don't really exist, right? And yeah. so let's just project a hologram and, and call it a day. That's all. We won't bother you. We won't talk about rebuilding the temple. Just allow us. May we please project a hologram and pretend that, that it's real? It's like we're all holograms, Jim. 
I mean, how, <laughs> how could a person calling himself a rabbi write that kind of thing? I digress. That's not even what I want to talk about. Now that we've laid this groundwork here in this unbelievably important Torah portion that has a message for all of us about being real with Hashem in this unbelievable week, which has a message for all humanity about being able to, to flow with what Hashem is giving us and about uh, being able to transit from mourning to joy because it's all from Hashem and Hashem is, is picking us up exactly what we read in Psalm 30. You have transformed my lament into joy. That's what this week is all about. That's the message for every person to find the Hashem in everything that we're going through. After yeah. having said all that. And the overarching message that to be a complete Jew one has to live and work and dwell daily in Eretz Israel. Jim, big story. Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> okay, now I don't know how big this story is outside of Israel. I don't know how many people are talking about it. I don't know if people think it's important, but let me explain to you why it is, okay? So on Monday this week, Ben and Jerry's, this Vermont-based ice cream company, announced that it would no longer distribute its products in the, quote, occupied Palestinian territory, referring to what's called West Bank settlements and East Jerusalem. This is a huge story here in Israel, not just because everybody loves Ben and Jerry's, but because of what it represents. And it is not a tempest in a teapot, meaning it is not a big deal about something trivially because it is not about ice cream. Ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. No, it's not about ice cream. It's about something much more serious than that. It's about this lie. That, speaking of holograms, speaking of virtual reality, the virtual reality is that people are of the persuasion convinced that that our land is occupied by us I, what don't we just talk about we talked about all these unbelievable archaeological discoveries my friends there's no palestinian archaeology we've discussed it tongue-in-cheek but it's not tr but it's not a joke it's true there is no such thing as a discovery of a, a, that reflects Palestinian nationality and statehood in this yeah. land, right? There is only an indigenous Jewish presence for over 3,000 years. So, so there's a very disturbing, first of all, Ben and Jerry's was, was owned by two Jew, Jews, Ben and Jerry. I believe that they are no longer the owners. I'm sure they're still in control. I don't know. I'm going to talk to you more about the policies of Ben and Jerry's in a moment. But the whole thing about this, that what it represents to me is a very disturbing trend among Jews who, who, who are label, labeling Israel as an apartheid state. In fact, there was a, a study that said that 22% of young Jews are anti-Israel. They are pro-BDS, boycott, divest, and sanction. They think that it was an apartheid state. And it's so ludicrous as to be, as to be uh, r ridiculous if it wasn't horrific, because anyone who knows anything about what's going on, who knows that the Palestinian leadership is abusing its own people, is the greatest civil rights violator, right. and <clears throat> is, is it to a totally exploitive and manipulative of its own people. And anything that is affecting the Palestinian, Palestinian people is not coming from Israel, we, the, because the Palestinians, so-called, who live in Israel, have the vote, they have positions in, in uh, every field of science and medicine and government. Yes. So what is this all ridiculous canard about apartheid state all about? It's just so ridiculous. So they go and they say that they're going to, that when the contract runs out, they're going to stop distributing their ice cream in occupied East Jerusalem and in occupied Palestinian territory. So first of all, um, people in Israel are absolutely fuming about this because again, it's not about ice cream. It's about the fact that the BDS movement, as was stated by the State Department spokesman, unfairly singles out Israel, right? And uh, the idea is that it is, the, the whole concept here is about um, this, this lie uh, that, that Israel's presence in its own land is, is illegal. 
So, so I want to just tell you a few things here that get off my, my chest, right? So the, what is the reaction of the United States State Department to this statement? Right, so the headline is, U.S. State Department vows to oppose BDS after Ben and Jerry settlement pullout. Spokesman says, boycott movement unfairly singles out Israel, but refuses to specifically address Vermont-based ice cream maker's decision. Fine. The idea is this. In 35 states in the United States of America, uh, it's illegal to boycott Israel. Yes. And these states, these states which don't include uh, Vermont, but they do include uh, Florida, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, California, Maryland, Texas, right? These states have passed anti-BDS legislation, which means that, uh, that Ben and Jerry's can be in trouble in America because this is illegal. And so uh, the idea is that uh, the United States State Department said that they're going to, that, they, that, that their position is clear. And they, and they, and they added that um, the U.S. will be a strong partner in fighting efforts around the world that potentially seek to delegitimize Israel. Because that's what this is really all about. Yeah. It's about an attempt to, to delegitimize Israel altogether. The thing is, this is all mixed messages. Because at the same time that, that the State Department seems to be on Israel's side saying, no, they had no right to do that. Apparently, um, the, even though the Biden administration has re repeated, reiterated its, its opposition to the, to, to the boycott Israel movement, right? At the same time, apparently, the Biden administration has put pressure on Prime Minister Bennett to slow the approval process for construction projects in Judea and Samaria. And it seems that there is a virtual freeze on construction projects for homes for our children in Judea and Samaria because of American pressure. So you understand how it works. On the one hand, they're saying, oh, we're anti-BDS. On the other hand, America does not recognize Israel's right to be in 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 these areas of our own land as well, just as Israel itself has a has a real split personality regarding our attitude about our own Temple Mount. It all comes from a lack of of um, <laughs> of, of having a position of of having the integrity to go the distance and to be able to make a, a commitment as to who we are in this land. We heard Hashem's voice, who is a wise and discerning people like you say, in this land. And this is, this is what the whole problem is really all about. The whole move by Ben and Jerry's uh, corporation, it, it's an empty gesture. On, on the one hand, by, by saying, we're not going to sell our ice cream in the so-called territories. Well, I, I would say to Ben and Jerry's, well, you, so you're going to deprive your Arab fans? And of course, the joke on them is, is that the Palestinians wouldn't wouldn't even touch a pint of Ben and Jerry's because they're not going to consume any product made by Jews. So I need to make this clear, though. I need to make it clear that that that, that the 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 French the franchise here in Israel for Ben and Jerry's um, has refused Ben and Jerry's conditions and says no, we're not going to stop distributing to our brethren. Good for them. Judea and Samaria. And so what, what, it all, what it all comes down to is that while all over the world, the Jewish communities are reacting to this, and there's been all sorts of news items about various kosher supermarkets and various lines that, have, that are discontinuing and taking it off the shelves. In America, the Jews, and hopefully people who stand with the Jewish people, mm -hmm. they are boycotting Ben and Jerry's. But here in Israel, the, 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 the actual Ben and Jerry's that's made here is not included in that because he, he was being threatened. He said, he stood up to them. They're going to take his license away. And by the way, Unilever, which is the, the parent company that purchased Ben and Jerry's. And they're the ones who made this statement that it's, that it is not consistent with our values to sell, to sell ice cream in the occupied Palestinian territories. Right. So, so they, they are uh, the ones who, who have brought this whole thing about, but, but, but the franchisee in, in Israel is doing his best to counter sure. all of this. Yeah, survive even. Yeah.
Exactly. It's amazing. Exactly. Well, so, so, so here in Israel, the, this is the idea is that we're, we're trying not to boycott this person who is really going out on, on a limb to try and, and stand up in the face of all of this, but the, but the, because they're the ones that are threatened. No, they're not going to, they're not going to renew it. And, the, and the, make a long story short again, it's not about the ice cream. It's about the, the reason that people in Israel are so incredibly offended and there's all these Knesset members that are videoing themselves throwing Ben and Jerry's into the garbage and saying okay now we know where to buy ice cream from and all of this kind of thing is because it has to do with an attempt in the name of this of this vapid liberalism like you say it's an empty gesture of placating these these demons and I'm going to get to that in a minute it's 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 just all about this whole politically correct thing and in the meantime, it is so damaging, it is so hurtful, it is so untrue, it is such a lie, it is such a distortion, a distortion of history, and it's so offensive. Yeah. And so that, that's why I say it's really not about ice cream. Let me, let me tell you something about Ben and Jerry's, okay? They added a flavor, I think it was in 2019, and this is from their website. The flavor is called Pecan Resist, as in We Can Resist. <laughs> So let me read to you uh, uh, from their uh, web website, and I quote, We are proud to announce that our newest flavor, Pecan Resist, has so much more than funky chunks under the lid. It supports four organizations that are working toward a more just and equitable future and peacefully resisting the Trump administration's regressive and discriminatory, discriminatory policies. These groups are working hard to defend and progress a more inclusive society, focusing on racial and gender equity, climate change, LGBTQ rights, and refugee and immigrant rights. Uh, goes on to describe the four groups, the four organizations that this flavor supports, that Ben and Jerry's supports. And one of them is Women's March. The head of Women's March is a woman named Linda Sarsour. Oh, please. Linda Sarsour is an incredible Israel hater and an incredible anti-Semite. Yeah. And so, and so this flavor, a pecan resist, they're so cool. They're just so cool. Has been funding these, these four organizations, including Women's March. And believe it or not, there was a whole to-do in the internet about the fact that Linda Sarsour, who hates Israel so much, who hates the Jewish people so much, was accepting this money before all of this happened. For years, she's been accepting this money from Ben & Jerry's, even though Ben & Jerry's has been has had a long-standing presence in Israel. So she was, as usual, as the liberals are, totally hypocritical. On the one hand, with this stance about Israel, but she was accepting their funding. In the meantime, that's who Ben and Jerry's is. Wow, and kind of, kind of li- leaves a bad taste in your mouth, doesn't it? Listen, even, even the mayor de Blasio said that he's not going to be having any more Cherry Garcia. <laughs> and uh, people have people have been have been reacting. And uh, again, uh, do what you want, people. You want to eat Ben and Jerry's and pretend that all is right with the world. Hey, maybe you could hitch a ride with one of these billionaires and go to another world. Also, you know, when things go bad, uh, the, what time has proven is all you have to do is blame the Jews, yeah. and that always works. And that's basically what this is all about. Anyway, the thing is. It's it's just so hypocritical and so amazing and so and so totally one dimensional the thinking the logic of all of these people and ironic because the whole goal of Hashem's giving the Torah to the people of Israel was to shine a light for all of humanity in this world not having to go into a spaceship but to improve the situation of all of humanity by developing a close relationship with the creator. There is a creator. There is a creator. That's what this is really all about. And the, and the thing that hurts me the most again is the, is the fact that, you know, even Jewish people are falling prey to this, to this um, heinous nefarious trend of blaming Israel for all of the world's uh, woes and of ignorantly, uh, w- without even the, an ounce of understanding, misrepresenting a, a, a Israel and categorizing it as all of these things, apartheid, et cetera, totally ignorant of what the reality here is on the ground. And all of the pal- so-called Palestinians who admit that the, be- the best hope that they've ever had is the state of Israel. Yeah. 
And so who, who are you hurting? You know, listen again. I, yeah. So it was good ice cream. Okay. But you know, I can go on, I can go on without it. I think. What jumps out at me in this Parsha is this, this whole reminder from, from Moshe Rabbeinu to the people of Israel and, and, and by extension, all of us that read this is that uh, this is a reminder of the purity of the purpose in worshiping the one true invisible creator. And the, that worship uh, for the people of Israel takes the form of them living in the nation under Torah laws every day in their own land. We will see something so remarkable that the nations will marvel. Exactly. Hashem, our God, sealed the covenant with us at Chorev. Not with our forefathers did Hashem seal this covenant, but with us. We who are here, all of us, alive today. Face to face did Hashem speak with you on the mountain from amid the fire. And that, that was his introduction in this Parsha to the Ten Commandments again. And yeah. yes, that, that, is, that is the goal. And there's so much that is real and vibrant and alive here in all of these messages for, for all of our listeners this week, the whole process of turning our mourning into joy, into expectation, into the palpable reality of Hashem's guidance in our lives. And it's all, like you say, a, a precursor, a, an allusion to the ultimate revelation, to the resurrection. And Hashem has a plan, and it doesn't involve us having to look for anything in space. It involves in taking responsibility for this world and making it into a better place. Yeah. And the the whole Ben and Jerry's thing, Jim, it's just so it's so disturbing to me that the world can be so corrupt and can turn on Israel for living in its own homeland. And as I say again, you know, officially. U.S. State Department against BDS, but yet discouraging Jews from being able to build their own homes, even in places like Eish Kodesh, where we live. So it's all it's all part of the plan. And, and then, uh, may we truly merit to see our lament turned into joy, as in Psalms 30. And... Um, like you say, there's other ice cream. There's only one land of Israel, though. That's the thing. Right. <laughs>